Wednesday. The message was about this thing of applying a life application in our life to have the application of who Jesus is in the Gospels in our lives. To apply Jesus in our life. And I don't know if you've ever wondered why are there four Gospels? Not five, not two, not three. But every gospel that is given speaks of another facet and aspect of who Jesus is and should be in our lives. If you want to get rid of 75, 80%, 90% of the issues that you have, listen to the message from Wednesday night. As Jesus, and we focused in on the gospel of John, according to John by the Spirit, where Jesus is emphasized as Savior. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal and everlasting life. And it starts the moment we believe in Jesus and we receive him into our life. To be Savior is not just for me 53 years ago, but is for today. Jesus is not just Savior when we give our life to the Lord. Jesus is Savior today, and man, did I mess up and not realize that. And so what happens is I don't I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out how do I get through life with all these things happening, not re realizing that Jesus is Savior for me today and is able to take care of every single situation today. And here's a good thing. If he doesn't take care of it today, there's a reason for it. One of them may be that you are at attempting to take care of it on your own that you would give it over to him and let him take care of it. He will take care of it. The second aspect that we talked about on Wednesday night, and I just want to cover it today because I'm going to be talking about the third aspect of the Gospels. I think this is probably the most controversial one that I'm going to be speaking of today by far. By far. But Jesus as King, in Matthew 28, from 18 to 20, he says that all power... All power has been given unto me. In heaven, on earth, I want you to go out. I want you to be, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I will be with you right to the end of the age. All power, all authority is his. When Jesus is seated on the throne of your life, and you're not in charge, but he's in charge, and I'm submitted to have Jesus Lord, I need to do two main things. Submit. I need to submit to his lordship, and I need to obey his command. Otherwise, he's not seated on the throne of your life. That's why we have so many problems in our life, when that's not the reality for us. He's not seated on the throne of our life, so I am. Or some, someone or something else is. And so when it comes to his commands, I pick and choose what I'm going to obey or not obey as it fits into who's in charge of my life. Oftentimes it would be me then. If the Lord isn't in charge, I'm in charge. 90% of your issues taken care of that foundation of Jesus Christ being Savior and Jesus Christ being King, being Lord in your life. Do what he tells you to do in his word. We need to go by the word. He is the word and he speaks life to us. So today, I've entitled this message, Seven Horns and Seven Eyes which is a really weird title, Seven Horns and Seven Eyes. In fact, I read it 
this morning already. You may not have caught it. I'm going to be reading again in a moment. The passage or the, the gospel that we're going to be focusing in on is Luke. And in Luke 3, verse 16... Like John 3.16, Luke 3.16 says, and this is John the Baptist speaking to those that were there, the crowds, the masses that were there, said to them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming whose sandal strap I am not worthy, worthy to loose. He will baptize you, immerse you, cover you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. I pray, Lord God, the things that don't belong in my life, let it burn. The things that are dragging me or holding me back, let it be burnt up. Let him burn up the chaff. How many of you would want to be eating not the, the result. Can you imagine making bread out of the chaff? I think it's impossible. You can't make bread out of the chaff. The chaff, you might say, what is chaff? Chaff is the around the kernel. There's this covering. There's, a, there's other things beside the kernel. So everything that's not the kernel of wheat or on a, a strand of wheat would be chaff or on oats, or whatever grain it may be, the part that is not the seed is chaff. Let it be burnt up. Let it be burnt up in our lives. All right. As I said earlier, this is probably the most controversial of the Gospels, if you really grab a hold of the focus. Luke was a physician, was a doctor, and he took all the eyewitnesses and he, he spoke to them directly that were directly involved with Jesus. Compiled everything. And he put it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit into this gospel that we are able to read. The good news. The good news of Jesus according to Luke. The inspiration of the Holy Spirit upon Luke. The beautiful thing is this. Luke also wrote the book of Acts, which is all about the acts of the apostles and believers in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the entire book is summarized in verse 8. Acts 1, verse 8. We'll talk about that later. The other thing that I want to do today, I want to Go to the Old Testament. We were talking about King Hezekiah. And uh, so we're going to be going to the Old Testament. We're going to be looking again. There are three main characters. The, the king, the priest, and also the prophet in Hezekiah's life. And we'll, we'll look into that. And how does how is all of this relate to Luke and his gospel to us, and we'll see uh, the seven horns and seven eyes. What is that all about? Let me just read quickly again, if you missed it when we opened. This is Revelations 5, verse 1 to 7, and I'll, I'll just pause, make a few notes on this, and I'll continue to finish the chapter. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Now, just quickly, if you haven't, you really need to recognize chapter 4 and 5 also regarding the book of Revelation. If you want to have the key to the book of Revelation, it's uh, Revelations chapter 1, verse 19. It gives the key of how the book of Revelation is set up. In chapter 4, we see it goes from the church, the churches that are mentioned in chapters 2 and 3. John is in the presence in chapter 1. 
That's the first part. The second part is chapters 2 and 3, which is the things that are right now. The church, the churches that are on the globe at this time, that were those seven churches were, were in existence 2,000 years ago. They were actual churches, seven churches. But then in chapter 4 of Revelation, it talks about, and then, then there was an opening in the heavens. Doors were opened in heaven. And that is when we see all the saints. Now, let me just say this. I truly believe chapters 4 and 5 have not taken place yet. In chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation, we will be there. So cool. So cool. We will be there. If you don't want, if you want to get excited, read chapter 4, and I'll listen to chapter 5 as I read through. We will be there, and we will also see what John saw. John, the disciple, the, the beloved of Jesus, 2,000 years ago, we will see what he saw already 2,000 years ago. Let this encourage you. Let this give you a hope. Jesus is the one that is able to open this scroll. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on a throne, that's the Father, a scroll. He had it in his right hand, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. This scroll has not been opened yet. It's not been opened yet. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. And so I wept much. Because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked. And behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, 24 elders, stood a lamb. Now listen carefully. As though it had been slain, a lamb as though it had been slain. Now, I have read this passage, I don't know how many times. It's only today, this morning, that I caught something that I didn't catch before. I don't know about you. Have you ever read scriptures many times and you read it again? It's like there's an opening of life. It's, there's a revelation that comes to you the rhema comes, the word, the logos comes to life. It came to life as I read it. I just, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because I want to speak to you about one of the things that is so controversial in the body of Christ today that there are entire denominations that say, I want nothing to do with this. We have nothing to do with this. There are people that will walk out of churches as soon as this is mentioned. It's happened even here in this church. I pray to God it doesn't happen today. Listen, listen to the description of the lamb. What did the lamb had, have? Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Question, do the horns and the eyes detach from the lamb, or do they stay on the lamb? I'll tell you, if you're not sure about the answer to this question, let me tell you that the, the horns and the eyes, the seven horns and the seven eyes do not detach from from the lamb that was slain. They don't detach. 
They are combined. They are together. You need to grab a hold of this. Now you might say, what do horns represent in, in the Bible? Old Testament, New Testament. Horns have to do with authority, with a dominion. To have authority or dominion. The Lamb of God. Now you might say, why seven horns? I've never seen a lamb with seven horns or seven eyes. This lamb has seven horns and seven eyes. Seven has to do with the number of completion. We know that the number of man is six. Not completed. The number of God is seven. Is in perfection. Now it's interesting. Seven horns. Seven eyes. Seven spirits. And it says what it is. What are these things? Which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Of power. Of dominion. Eyes. Eyes have to do with with seeing. You know, Jesus said, you know, they see, they don't perceive, they don't understand. They have eyes. When he came, they don't understand, they don't see. Eyes, seven eyes, has to do with perfect sight and vision, perception, Perfect understanding. When you see perfectly, it's like, uh-huh. Oh, I see what is happening. He sees all. He knows all. He understands all. He is all wise. It has to do with wisdom. Power and wisdom. Power and wisdom. All through with the lamb that was slain. All right. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lord, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, and I just thank, God, thank the Lord, the songs that were written or the songs that we sang today included aspects of this chapter. And the cool thing is, uh, who, who came with the song? Who did the songs this morning? Sorry? Tyler? Tyler had the songs already written on, I think it was Thursday or Friday, knew which songs were going to be. I, I didn't even know what the message was going to be yet. In fact, last night, and I, you know, I've already been saying this many times. Last night I went to bed and I, I wasn't sure. Lord, what do I preach on today? I knew I was going to be preaching around either... Mark or Luke? The Lord knows by his spirit. Man, let us be led by his spirit. Thank you, Tyler, for being led by the spirit in the worship this morning. The song, even the song selected, that we would be led by the spirit of God who knows all things and is all powerful. All with the lamb attached to the lamb that was slain for us. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and, op and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests. That's what our series is about. Kings and priests. You and I being kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Kings and priests to God reigning, ministering, and power and authority with all wisdom that doesn't come from us, that comes from him. In 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it talks about being a royal priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. We should show forth the praises of him who has taken us out of darkness and put us into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. That we would lift up his name. The ministry that we are to do is unto God, Vertic vertical ministry. Man, let, let me minister to the Lord. And this song that I'm going to just read in a moment 
There's a ministry that goes up to the Lord. When it comes to the horizontal ministry, ministry that we need to have, not just vertical, but horizontal ministry to those that we come into contact with. Doesn't matter who they are, whether it's family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, the stranger, whoever the Lord puts into our place, Lord, let me minister in one way or another, even if it's without a word, even if it's without, that they would see Jesus, they would see something different within me. All of us, all of us, to be that royal priesthood, kings and priests. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times, 10,000 and thousands of thousands. We are talking billions standing before the throne. From the beginning of time, right to the last person standing before the throne. Actually... It will be before the end of time because this is going to take place. Should the Lord come back today, we'll begin today. If the Lord comes back today. And this is the song that they sang with a loud voice. Worthy, this is what we sang today. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. I think it was the third song that we sang. To receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Can I just read that again? I'm going to use my fingers here. And I'm going to use one hand. So count how many fingers I put up. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. That's Jesus Christ who was slain 2,000 years ago on a cross to receive from who? From us. That's our vertical ministry. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. How many, how many fingers did I put up? Seven. This aspect of perfection, that our worship would be of perfection to the Lord of power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. That we would operate in that, in our lives and who we are, not just when we come on a Sunday morning, but when we operate every single day, we would oper operate in the power and the riches and the wisdom and the strength and the honor and the glory and the blessing of the Lord. That it would bring an honor to Him. It would bring glory because He is worthy. He is worthy. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Let me just say, chapter 6, the seals start to open up. They have not been opened yet, but we know as you read chapters 6 through 19 what is coming. You do not want to be here on this earth during chapters 6 and 19. You don't want your friends. You, want, you don't want your neighbors. You don't want your loved ones. You don't want your, the stranger to be left on this planet during, during chapters 6 through 19. Saying, well, what is that all about? Go home this afternoon and read it. And I say this with all gravity. I say this with all love. And today, if I'm animated in any way, you don't, don't misconstrue my animation. I love you. And if I'm upset or angry, it will be at the one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy you and me. And take away anything of the abundance of life that God has for you and for me. And for every other person that is on this planet that doesn't know him. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life. They may have it more abundantly. The fullness of life should be flowing through us to minister to others. 
Don't let the enemy steal from you. Seven horns, seven eyes, the seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit working through us. We're talking about the Holy Spirit in the perfection and completion of power, in the perfection and completion of all wisdom, functioning in you and in me. Lord, that I would not grieve the Spirit of God and say, no, I don't want this. I don't want this. I wept yesterday. Was angry and upset and weeping. When there are those that are believers that say, I want nothing to do with this. And this is something that should not be happening today. Let me expand on it. Now, seven horns, seven eyes is the seven spirits of God that are on the Lamb. You might say, is there anything in scriptures that would tie this together besides this in Revelation? And there is. And that's where I, I want to talk about the prophet that was to Hezekiah, who lived during the 8th century B.C., so right into the, like the, the 700s B.C., Hezekiah finished the figure around 697 or 696 uh, B.C. is when Hezekiah finished his, his kingship that he died. I mentioned this, I think, last time or time before. So King Hezekiah went from 725 B.C. to 697 B.C., 29 years. He was the godliest of the kings like his father David. Now, David had lived about 300 years before. doesn't even mention his biological father, Ahaz, because Ahaz was not a good king. He was a wicked king, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Terrible. But not Hezekiah. I just want to say to you, you don't need to be like your, your parents if they were not good. Absolutely not. You would do what is right before the Lord. And it says of him in 2 Kings 8, 18, verse 5, it says, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him, even when the mighty superpower of that day, Assyria, came, he rebelled against this king because he trusted in the Lord. There's so much in this that we talked about already, but definitely who Jesus is as Savior and who he is as King he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I mentioned to you, I think it was last time, the, the name, the meanings of their name, King Hezekiah. Hezekiah means Jehovah has made strong. The high priest at that time was Azariah, which his name means Jehovah has helped. And the prophet at that time, during his kingship, is Isaiah, and his name means Jehovah has saved. Jehovah has made strong, Jehovah has helped, and Jehovah has saved. Let that be in your life. Now, seven horns, seven eyes, the seven spirit spirits of, the, of God. Has Isaiah 11, verse 1 and 2. There shall come forth a rod little stem or a little shoot from the stem of Jesse. You may say, who is Jesse? Jesse was David's father, King David, the one that's 
referenced here that that was Hezekiah's father, like his father David, that's the King David. So Jesse was King David's father. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Verse 2, listen. So here we have this reference that I read of in Revelation as well. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 11, over more than 700 years B.C., was already spoken. And it says, now count with me, the number of spirits or names or things that are listed. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, upon this branch, this shoot, the stem of Jesse. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. How many times, seven times, is mentioned here? You might say, did they really know about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? I tell you, they didn't know what we know now. But they already had beautiful words spoken to them that we read of now regarding the Spirit of God. This thing of perfection, of power, and of wisdom. Let me say again, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord on, was on Jesus. And Jesus would have that same spirit on you. How many of you want the spirit of the Lord upon you? How many of you want the spirit of wisdom? How many, the wisdom that comes from him. How many of you want the spirit of understanding and the spirit of counsel when you don't know what you're doing? Man, the spirit of counsel is saying, this is what you need to do. And when you, you don't have the strength and you don't have the might, this is the spirit upon me. The spirit of might is upon me. The spirit of knowledge, when I don't know, he knows. And the spirit of the fear of the Lord, Lord, that I will honor you with my life. You are king of kings and lord of lords. I'm going to place all my trust in you. I want that spirit upon me. In Isaiah 42, verse 1, it says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. That's us. Unless you're Jewish. That's us. We're Gentiles. And so here we have a triune God. The one that is speaking is God the Father. And he is saying, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I delight in my son, Jesus. I have put my spirit upon him, Jesus. And he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Man, let your spirit be upon me, Lord God. Lord, I pray there would be nothing in me that would hinder you in any way. Lord, take out of me everything that is of self, that is of the flesh. Lord, I pray that the flesh would be crucified daily, that my flesh would be crucified daily. The old man, the old nature would be crucified daily. Let your spirit rest upon me, the same spirit that was upon you, Lord God. Let it rest upon me. In Jesus' name that you would receive all the glory, Lord. So did this actually happen? Did the Spirit come upon the Lord Jesus? In Luke 3, 21, it says, When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son, and you, I am well pleased. It was fulfilled 2,000 years ago. It was prophesied by Isaiah over 2,700 years ago. The Lord is faithful to his word, to keep his word. I know we struggle with his timing at, time, at times, but he is faithful. Jesus, 
Well, let me read what it says in Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. This is what it says, Isaiah, 700 ye years B.C. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He is actually speaking what Jesus would be saying. He's, he has been unctioned by the Holy Spirit. Write these words down, Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me. To preach good tidings to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison, prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. I don't know if you're mourning. I don't know if you're feeling poor. If you're feeling brokenhearted, if you're feeling like you're a captive, if you're feeling like you're in prison and you're bound and you say, how am I going to get out of this? Is the Lord able to do something? Did this prophecy come to fulfillment? Let me read Luke 4. I'm sticking to Luke here for a number of these passages and to Isaiah. Luke 4 verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. This is after he was baptized and the Spirit came upon him. And he returned in power, in the power of the Spirit, to Galilee. And news of him went out throughout all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. I'm, just, I'm going to read a little bit more than just what was uh, prophesied in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. I want, I want you to see... The response of people to the Holy Spirit on Jesus. Because I'll tell you right now, don't let it be you. Do not let it be you. Okay? And how extreme. And I, it's, it's not, I've experienced this regarding the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Seven horns, seven eyes, the fullness of the spirit, the spirit without measure that Jesus had, that we can have too. Like I say, I wept yesterday. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. We know you. They knew him there in Nazareth because that's where he grew up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Jesus went to church, to the synagogue. They knew him in the synagogue because he read often before his ministry began. But this day was different. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. That's what the, the Holy Spirit would work through him for those that he would minister to. To proclaim the accept, acceptable year of the Lord it is now. The year of Jubilee is now. All right. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Maybe they were expecting him to say more. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he begins to speak. He began to speak to them. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? 
We know Jesus. He grew up here. What is he saying here? Spirit of the Lord is upon him. I am the fulfillment of this prophecy. And he discerned. Now look, look at how things very quickly change. And it's like, Jesus, why are you saying these things? Why are you saying these things? Don't you want unity? He said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have, whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And he said, as surely I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Yeah, I won't be accepted in my own hometown here. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three and a half or three years and six months. There was a great famine throughout all the land, but to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow, not even of Israel, not in the, in the the towns of Israel. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha, his protege, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian, not even a Jew. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. They were ready to kill him. They were ready to kill him because of this prophetic word. That he's saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Do you want power and wisdom in your life? I'll tell you right now, there may be those, uh, those that struggle with what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. Those that grab a hold of what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life and through your life and they, they receive, will have rivers of living water bring life to them as the gospel is seen in you and heard from you. In Ephesians 4, verse 30, may I say this? Is it possible to grieve the Holy Spirit? When the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus, it was like a dove. It wasn't like an eagle. It wasn't like a hawk. It was like a dove. I know I grew up with doves. They are very, very gentle creatures. My dad had some turtle doves, beautiful doves in the, in the morning. Just that, oh, I can't do it. I used to be able to do it. It was a little bit of a, like a turtle dove. And you hear that in the morning, it's like, oh, and it's usually in the morning, morning doves. The Holy Spirit descending on Jesus like a dove. We can shut the Holy Spirit down in our life. There are entire, as I mentioned earlier, entire denominations that say no. And even in Pentecostal denominations, those that even in churches now, I'm hearing you saying, ah, sorry, Holy Spirit, you know what? A little bit too much. You know, ah, too much. Just sorry. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So here he has saved you. You're saying, but no, I don't want any more. I don't want anything more of you. The moment you're saved, there's a portion, the earnest of the Spirit is put in with, within you, and you are sealed by God for the day of redemption. And it's like, but I don't want to do, I don't, Holy Spirit, I don't want anything more of you. Just, just go away. The 
promise of the Father. Luke ends off. So he starts with Luke 3.16, where John is saying, hey, there's one that's going to baptize you with water. Or I, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sound strap I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you, immerse you in the Holy Spirit and fire. At the very end of Luke, the last chapter, the last few verses, Jesus said to his disciple or to those that were with him, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. It's already happened. At that point, it had already happened. He had died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. And that, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You need to tell everyone about the fact that you can have repentance, you need to repent, and you need to have remission of sins. It is sin that keeps people from God and would have people go to an eternity apart from Him. He says you need to repent. There needs to be a repentance, a turning, and there needs to be remission of sins. Your sins have to be taken care of. It is only by the finished work, the blood of Jesus that was shed, that we can have cleansing from our sins. It is only through His blood. And so this needs to be preached. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Do not go out until you are a dude with power from on high. Let's jump to Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Last, things, last thing that Jesus said before he left the planet. The last thing he said. And being assembled together with them, Acts 1, 4, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, they were thinking of a political power thing to overcome the Roman Empire. And the Lord is saying, you know what? My kingdom is so far beyond the Roman Empire. And at that point, it wasn't very large. But the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is the one that oversees the kingdom of God according to the will of the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit available to us. So the things that are happening even now, don't you be afraid. The Lord is in complete control of all things. And he said, it's not said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, the last part of this verse basically orders all of the book of Acts. And if you read the last chapter of the book of Acts, you will recognize where's the rest of it. It just ends off, and it's like, well, isn't there an ending to this book? I would say to you, no, because it is still being written today through you and through me, hopefully. It is still being written over the centuries, over the millennia, those two millennia that we've had s since that point. It is being written, the book is still written, and Luke is saying, you will be witness that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and all Judea and Samaria. It was done. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. I like it, what it says here. It doesn't say and to the Middle East or to Europe or Asia. North America, South America, doesn't say that. It says, and to the end of the earth. So many would say, you know what? This power, it stopped 2,000 years ago with the apostles. It's not for today. 
not according to this verse, to the end of the earth, which is today. Here's what we need. Isaiah 44, verse 3. For I will pour water. Listen, I will pour water on him who is thirsty. I'm thirsty right now. I had somebody give me. They had, we, had, we were together and said, hey, man, I use this stuff. I'm going to get you some next time I see you. And so they got this all day dry mouth spray. very good. But let me tell you, it is nothing compared to cold water. It's like, oh man, I'm so thirsty. As tasty as that is, it does nothing for those that thirst when it comes to water. Let me read again. You're saying, Pastor, I want the Holy Spirit. I want you to begin to thirst. Get thirsty. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. The amazing thing is, when it comes to being baptized in the Holy Spirit, it is all about not just you. It is for you individually. And it is for those that as the waters flow from you, rivers of living water, it is for those that are around you to impact their lives. There are so many that are thirsty just saying, man, I am, it's like I'm in a desert place. Believers. The unbeliever, can you imagine where the unbeliever is? It's like, it's like they're not only in the desert, they're in darkness. They can't even see where they're going. They don't even know that they're headed. They're on a highway that is leading to destruction, an eternity apart from God. In Joel, who lived around 800 years before Christ, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, not just on some, but on all. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Was this fulfilled? In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, Acts chapter 1, verse 8 was fulfilled. It says, and they were all filled. They were thirsting. filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They began to speak with new tongues as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the issue. People don't have a problem so much with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But man, they have a problem with the sign that comes with the Holy Spirit. I don't understand why he chose that sign. As Jesus said in Mark 16, those that believe in Jesus' name, they will cast out demons. You have authority. If you are baptized in the Holy Spirit or just have the, sp the earnest of the Spirit in your life, a portion of the Spirit, you have authority to cast out demons. Can I just say this? But there is so much more. It says in Mark 16, he says, and you will speak. Those that believe in Jesus' name will speak with tongues, with new tongues. This is where it seems like people get up and leave. I... I'll take you, Holy Spirit, but the tongues, like why? Isaiah 28 talks about with stammering lips and, an, and not another tongue, God would speak. 
And when we begin to speak at times with a stammering lip and with another tongue, a new tongue, the Spirit of God is unctioning our spirit. We are allowing our spirit to begin to pray mysteries to us. They're not mysteries to Him. And we begin to pray what our spirit, by the Holy Spirit, desires to pray. Your spirit within you. Your spirit. We're made, we're made up of, of flesh, our body, our soul, and our spirit. Your spirit longs, is thirsting. If only I can continue to praise and worship the God. When I can't, when I stop in my worship and praise of God in the natural understanding that I would begin to praise and worship God in a new tongue. Lord Jesus, that you would receive all the glory and praise through me. Lord, that my life would bring you glory and praise. No kora basi kalara basandaria, ribisi hatora handia, makora sahasia. Lord, let your Spirit bring me life and refreshing and rest, and let your Spirit rivers of living water flow from me to others. The things that we would pray unto the Lord in another new language and tongue. We may not understand it, but it is of the Spirit of God as we are unctioned by the Spirit of God to begin to praise and worship Him. Why would we say, I don't want that? I don't want that. I don't want to glorify God by my, with my spirit. I just want to hold back because I don't maybe I don't understand or I'm afraid or I doubt or whatever. May I say this? I can start or stop whenever I choose. I can at times go without. I, I remember when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit at 14 years of age, I went for months without praying in the Spirit because I didn't understand what it was all about. I wouldn't pray in the Spirit. I wouldn't worship in the Spirit. I wouldn't sing in the Spirit because I didn't understand it was my Spirit glorifying God. Why would I want to limit it? Now it's like, oh man, it came to my mind that another reason that we speak in tongues is that our spirit is being edified. I call it spiritual bodybuilding. Man, do you want for your spirit to be buff? <laughs> I don't want to, I know it sounds a little bit crude, but to be edified means to be built up, to be strengthened. And let me just tell you, physically, I could not believe how much little exercise I needed to do. This was back in the early 90s when I was a lot younger. And I'll just give you an example of physical bodybuilding. In six months, I went from bench pressing 140 pounds to bench pressing 280 pounds. Now, for the guys that do any bench pressing, you say, okay, well, that's not bad, Pastor. I can do more than that. In six months, how much more spiritual edification that you take time? That's why Paul says, I speak in tongues more than you all. It wasn't, ne it wasn't necessarily in church. It was when he was on his own. He began to pray in the Spirit. Lord God, fill us with your Spirit. Lord, let me not grieve your Spirit. Because not only that, when I was 14 and I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, the ministry that God had for me personally took off like never before. You've heard me say, I could not speak in front of people. I could not. And yet at the age of 14, Andrew knows, he's my witness, there was a band that was started, and we went after the third year and the fourth year. We were out 30 to 40 times a year in that third and fourth year. And let me say this. Not once as a worship or a, a, a contemporary Christian band 
Do we ask anybody, hey, can we come and play at your church? Not one time. Why? Because this group of young lads in their teens, the youngest was 12 or 13, 12 when he started. I was 14, turning 15. I say all of that to say this, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I just say, thank you, Lord. The, uh, the, the guy that could not stand in front of a class, in front of people, is standing in front of people because of the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, Lord, I don't want to grieve you. Yesterday, for three and a half hours, for three and a half hours, I had to defend this passage, these passages. Three and a half hours. This cannot happen. This thing of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, no. No. Thank God it wasn't anybody from our church. This cannot go on. This, you, you, no, you can't do this. Where are you heading? Can I read the word of God? No, I, we don't want to hear the word. When you start talking about this, according to the word of God, suddenly there's this, no, 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 no. We, we don't read the word. I'll tell you, at that point, you say, are, are these individuals saved? Sure. But are they influenced by the enemy? Because it's the enemy that would say, I, I definitely don't want any 14-year-old any being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't want a 14-year-old baptized in the Holy Spirit. This week, we have about 100 youth, over 100 youth that are going to be, they're, they're leaving today. Some of our youth are leaving today. Five of our youth, we have, I don't know, another five or six or seven young adults that are going as youth camp counselors. We're going to be praying that there will be a work done. Can we stand together? Can I have the worship team? I don't know if, if the, the whole worship team is here. I know some, might, some have to go to work or whatever, but if, if you can come. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them, and that is for us too. We can have the Spirit without measure, just like as was on Jesus. And while Peter was still speaking these words to Cornelius and his, his family and his servants, that Roman centurion, the Holy Spirit fell upon all of those who heard the word and those of the circumcision, the Jews who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, the six that were with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify the Lord. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So he, he preaches of Jesus. They receive the word. They get saved. And immediately the Holy Spirit falls upon them. They begin to speak in other tongues. And they're saying, hey, they probably didn't even know about water baptism. Peter had to explain that. Let's, you guys got to get baptized. Saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, baptized and water on the same day. I look forward to that day. Man. Wow. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will lay, take up serpents, if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying side, signs with authority, power, and wisdom. The authority, the horns, the seven horns, the seven eyes, the Holy Spirit, 
connected to the whole to to the lamb you're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ the lamb of god slain for us Jesus Christ and him crucified in the power of the holy spirit let it be let it be let it be yeah you know what that's right let's give a clap offering onto the lord he is willing he's desirous to fill us we're going to pray we're going to pray for the the youth, we're going to pray for us. I'm going to be praying, Lord, for those that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, they continue, continue to, to be taking in the Holy Spirit, that they be actually moving in the Holy Spirit. But also, if you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you don't need to come to the altar. You don't need anything other than to say, I give my life to you, Jesus. I am a sinner. You died for me. You took all my sins upon yourself. Come into my life. Give your life to Jesus. You can do that even now. Believe on who Jesus is for you, the lamb that was slain. You want the horns, the seven horns and the seven eyes of the spirit, the seven spirits of God that go all over the earth that is here today. The Holy Spirit is here today. Let there be an outpouring of the spirit of God in your life. Lord, for our young people and all the young people that are gathering together this week, Lord, I pray that there would be a receiving of the Spirit of God in their lives, that they would be, if there's anybody that is going that is not saved, they would be saved. Lord, if there's anybody that is saved, but Lord has not been filled with your Spirit, has been baptized in your Spirit with the power of and with the wisdom of the Spirit of God in them, Lord, that it, that would happen. Lord, rivers of living water flowing from them, that it would happen this week to our children that are going. Lord, I pray for those that are here. Lord, maybe they are the ones that say, no, that's not for me. Lord, maybe today they're say, yes, I do want the fullness of the Spirit of God on me. That there would be not just the spirit within me, but there'd be rivers of living water flowing from me. Lord, I pray this. I pray that there would be a thirsting. Lord, there would be, they would thirst because, Lord, you want to quench that thirst by your spirit. You want to pour out your spirit upon us. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. It was great having you here today. If you want to listen to more messages, you can click here or here. Also, check out our website, lighthouseniagara.com, for more information and podcasts and also to give. God bless you. Have a great day.